Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Story Of. This time, it's Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker was released in April 2010 on the PSP and later released on the PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the Metal Gear Solid HD collection. Peace Walker is the first game in canon to not be available on a console, the first drawing a teen rating, and the first to feature illustrations instead of cutscenes. We're not counting portable ops, obviously, in the main canon here. But the artwork is done by the same artist, Ashley Wood. Peace Walker takes place in 1974, 10 years after the events of Metal Gear Solid 3, and around two or three months before Ground Zeroes. We see Big Boss on a motorcycle, the Militaire Sans Frontières, Soldiers Without Borders logo behind. Soldiers are on the beach practicing CQC, a snake removes his shirt, and we see a giant snake scar across his chest, like the one the boss donned. More on that later. This area acts as a training session. Kazuhira Miller, aka Kaz, informs Big Boss he's brought a visitor. It's worth noting Big Boss is not a fan of being called Big Boss and would rather be called Snake or Vic Boss. Coffee is made and we see a figure with a red hand, Professor Ramon Galvez Mena. He's visiting Colombia from Costa Rica to talk of peace. And we're not going to address the red riding hood in the room. <laughs> Ramon talks about armed groups being seen in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica doesn't have an army. Our little red hooded friend chimes in about the peace constitution. So basically they can't fight. They can't bear arms. They do not have an army. But he says that these aren't guerrillas. They're organized and armed to the teeth. And there's some heavy eye contact going on. Slam coffee. This art style brings a whole new layer to Metal Gear, which I'm in love with. We learn that the local authorities lie and say it's simply a security firm, but they're bringing in a bunch of weaponry by shipload, and Ramon fears it's CIA. Red Hood chimes in that they can't bear arms again. Our men have neither state nor ideology and will fight anyone, aka we do what we want for what we want. Ah, so we see why he's talking to us. Galvez begs to use us as a deterrent, that he doesn't have any money, but he can offer an operating base at an offshore plant in the Caribbean and a helicopter. Mother bees. Aww. And Kaz likes the idea of settling down. Snake, not so much. Snake's a little bit offended, but this guy ensures him he's just a teacher wanting peace, and this red hooded person is his student in true Kojima fashion named Paz. Ortega. Paz meaning peace. And what do you know? Kazuhira is Japanese for peace as well, which I did not know. Galvez tells of a supply port that had captured Paz while she was looking for her friend. She's only 16 and happened to get captured and tortured but was able to escape. She claims that her only purpose is peace and tries to convince us on this mission. Ramon then drops the big boss on us. Oh, Suddenly, we land in Costa Rica, and Kaz is supporting us from our new mother base. So, I guess the plans went ahead? What? Kaz brings up that we're doing it for her. And we're back in time again. Snake wants to stay a nomad, but Kaz wants a base. But we're worried about being a warmonger, and that this group is obviously related with the CIA. They assume the professor must be KGB. How they came to that, I don't really know still. Oh damn, he's got a thumb light. Awesome. Ramon shows off his cool prosthetic hand. We get a little bit of foreshadowing and talks about our legend. And Snake, like all of the snakes, <laughs> downplays his legend and lets him know that we're on to him being KGB. And he's like, okay, let's just cut the shit. Here's the deal. He wants to split the Americas in two with a socialist stronghold and gain a base who controls Central America. He who controls Central America will win this Cold War. And he's prepped by providing aid to the Sandinista National Liberation Front after instigating anti-Samoza sentiment, so basically getting these people to overthrow for them. The CIA is already there to stop them and has other plans, but they don't know the answer. Well, Galvez wants the answer and to drive them out of the country. Basically, it's a KGB versus CIA turf war going on. Kaz asks about Paz. <laughs> and Ramon says she doesn't know that he's KGB. He explains she's not there just as a pawn to gain sympathy, and there's a little bit more to it. So when Paz was captured, it was probably because something her friend had recorded. Ah, Walkman! So Paz's friend researched birds and was recording their calls and stumbled across a very familiar voice. Go home. The boss! Snake is rightfully confused. Ramon looks insane. Boss is sweating. And that's one a hell of a way of getting us involved. Kaz suggests it must be a trap because clearly we killed the boss. She's, she's dead. But Ramon goes to burn the tape, but Snake snatches it away saying he'll do it for pause and for peace. So that's why we're doing this. So as Snake, we sneak through the CIA guards to the supply facility and somebody's being tortured. <laughs> Snake holds up a guard to find where the cargo is headed. 
It's going to the mountains. And holy flashing. <laughs> okay, snake, chill. We see a flying thing outside. We find a map and find film badges and realize that the cargo was Spears, AKA nukes. Holy mother of God. So the map we obtained is not great and we need more intel. So we need to talk to the Sandinista Comandante. Kaz is handling our new mother base, MSF's Haven. Now look at that cute little codec pic Paz has. In Peace Walker, we are armed with a Fulton recovery unit, aka a giant balloon that we can strap to people's back and bring them to Mother Base, with their blessing or against their will. And this is the Mother Base system. You upgrade your different departments to make Mother Base stronger to have more support, and we basically build our own little haven. It's really satisfying. So now we need to head to this boathouse location to meet with the Sandinista leader, because they've been under attack. We make our way to the boathouse and Snake dramatically busts in demanding to meet this old boss look-alike. It reminds me of that inside of Metal Gear Solid 1 picture of Big Boss. We're informed that he's dead by his daughter, the new Comandante, and offer a peace offering of Cuban cigars. Well, it's Amanda Valenciano Libre. We pretend we're here to take pictures of birds, and she calls our obvious bluff. I mean, you need a telephone to lens for birds. Come on, it's not a rookie thing. Who's this Chico kid? Amanda knows the troops are CIA already. She also knows of a banana factory in the north up the barge, but she doesn't recommend going because they've been torturing and killing her compas for information. We learn Chico is Amanda's little brother and she doesn't feel like she deserves her title. And Snake can be really encouraging sometimes. We love him for that. Chico notices the giant flying thing we saw earlier and this time it opens fire. These things really remind me of the ciphers from Metal Gear Solid 2. Snake grabs a rocket launcher and takes out some of the small unmanned robots but one snatch is Chico. Amanda calls her men to follow the robot and find Chico. If something like that is guarding stuff for the CIA, it must mean they're protecting nukes, because that's pretty legit. We go follow Amanda and her men, and this bridge looks familiar, and the swamp, and just three vibes. We see armored guards and tanks arrive, and baby, it's boss battle time, and the eye patch meme is born. So throughout this game, you have a lot of these little mini battles. We defeat them and catch another glimpse of the giant drone-like thing in its ciphers. One spots Amanda and snatches her up, but she cuts herself loose, landing on her ankle, breaking it, and still getting re-snatched. Amanda calls for us to shoot the cipher, and we do, and now she falls on her back. Yikes. Though I do love hearing him scream, Amanda! <laughs> Homegirl just wants a cigarette and to find Chico. She reveals Samoza chased them out of Nicaragua to here, and the only way they can keep fighting is because the banana factory is a front for a drug refining plant that the KGB is paying them to run. They wanted to rebuild their country, even if it meant they had to do it dirty. They've lost their plan, and there's no way to regroup, but hey, he rolled one for us. Thanks, Snake. She knows we're going after that cargo, and we tell her it may be nukes. She's shocked, but gives us insight to locate the base. Amanda says Chico also knows a lot about the bases, so we've got to go find him in prison so he can help us out. She also asks us to kill Chico if we cannot rescue him to help keep his honor. Rough. But we're not making any promises. Snake suggests Amanda join MSF. Revealing, I'm Snake. <laughs> we tell Kaz to pick up Amanda and we're headed to the prison to get Chico and then headed to the cargo, aka nukes. Amanda tells us via codec the CIA took over some houses in the area and Chico is probably in one of them. We can locate the CIA houses with the new blue doors. We do our best peeping through doors until we locate Chico. We find him and he still thinks we're a photographer. Dude, come on, look at me. I'm just here for the birds of the battlefield. We tell him Amanda is safe and she's just busted up and this kid still wants a cigar. Chico tells us how they move the cargo into the jungle by train, then truck, then into a tunnel. He says no one knows what's on the other side of the tunnel because a giant monster spirit, the king of snakes. Chico saw it with his own eyes, an 80 foot tall walking beast. We learn that he gave up his compas during torture and he wants to die. Snake offers to help him out, but we teach him a lesson instead. He's born a new man and that life is now ours to own. Ay, our first child soldier. He can kill for us, but you sure can't smoke, kid. Chico looks relieved and he's Fultoned off. Now we're off to the train station to stop that cargo. We take out the guards and take a look inside the train. The nukes are already loaded onto the trucks and headed into the tunnel. We're too late. We are spotted by a tank and almost blown to bits as it shoots the train car, blocking the tunnel. Awesome. Another battle time. After that grueling business, we have to go back through the village up north since the tunnel is kaput. Backtracking time, just like the good old days. There's a barricade we have to destroy with C4 and continue on our way towards the transport. We find a large underground garage with donkeys and rows of trucks. We 
you have to look at all the license plates to try to find the one that was carrying the nukes. And this area is loaded with really fun Easter eggs. Metal Gear, Mei Ling, it's fun. We locate the truck because it's still warm, but the nukes have been moved. And we overhear a conversation. Someone who has a very familiar voice is angry about a launch. It was going to be a deterrent. Another man argues that they need to show they're capable of launching a nuke to be taken seriously. They argue about the bipedal being sold from the Russians and we kind of have a little flashback of uh, Gran in there. They need to prove Peace Walker, game title, is capable or it's useless as a deterrent. The doctor feels used and gets thrown down the stairs in his wheelchair and Baldi flashes a V for victory and we learn that his name is Hot Coldman. Snake comes to the wheelchair man's aid, and the doctor claims He's gonna launch a nuke! We come face to face with Peace Walker, but it's being airlifted by the giant drone. A Shagohod mini appears. Poopa is an amphibious AI attack craft, and we fight it with the doctor's support. We down it, and he tells us to blow the hatch and get into the AI pod. We now have to pull out all the AI memory boards within a certain time period, and the machine blows up, and the AI pod pieces out. Pun intended. <laughs> we learn that this doctor is a scientist, and he made the prototype we just fought, Huey. He's also got an awesome wheelchair capable of stairs. Hell yeah. And we continue lying, this time saying we're an entomologist, as if anyone believes that this man is really trying to find a butterfly. Huey tells us the nukes and all the research is for an unmanned weapon, ran by AI. The flying one we've seen is the chrysalis version, and the treaded is cocoon. Ah, a theme emerges. Hot Coldman is a disgraced CIA running the show. The Peace Walker Project is a mobile unmanned platform for launching nukes. This is the beast that Chico saw in the jungle. Coldman needs money to make more bipedals, but needs funding so the demonstration will help with impressing Langley. So this thing makes it capable of any terrain you can launch nukes off of. Nuclear deterrence is just a theory because humans need to make the decision to strike. And if it is mutual destruction, we're more than likely to not do it. But an AI retaliation will be certain. No matter what, it will happen. So whoever wants to launch a nuke won't be able to without ensuring we're destroying the human race. Coldman wants to prove that retaliation will be done by a machine, not a human. Is this making sense? We learn a little bit more about Huey and that his father worked on the Manhattan Project. Hmm, sounds familiar. And that he wants to stop the launch. He tells us where the final test space is and that Peace Walker isn't finished yet. It's still missing its core AI. The reptile pod he was working on still needs to be able to make high level decisions like a human brain. It's being made in a research lab by someone called Dr. Strangelove. Strangelove. An AI expert. She hates everybody. She sounds fun. Huey gives us his key card so we can go to the lab and destroy it. Plus a letter to deliver to her. Hmm. Snake offers Huey to join in Outer Haven because, you know, he's going to hell anyways. He agrees. We can start work on that bipedal mech. Snake is riding a mule and Paz is giving us directions through the jungle. Coldman is on to us and raise the guards. But hey, we're looking insane, so something tells me that's not going to be an issue. And as we admire the butterflies, a hind and crew corner us. Next battle time. We defeat it, it explodes, and we continue through some ruins. We find a woman against a tree. Man, there are pervy cameras everywhere in every Metal Gear. We learn her name is Cecile, and we reveal our third occupation in the last couple days, an ornithologist this time. But wait, she's an ornithologist as well. She's the one who was using the cassette tape to record birds. Cecile tells us she was captured by that woman, but that she was kind. She escaped with a stolen key card, but didn't make it far because look what she's wearing, and tells us there was another woman in the facility that she could hear talking and singing. She lost all of her belongings, so Snake offers for her to stay with MSF and will help her get back to Paris. Plus, we got cigarettes. She speaks of a tube she saw that said the words Jack, which clearly triggers us. Triggered, triggered, triggered. Cause is unsure, but we tell him, hey, she's blonde, so he agrees to pick her up. Pretty foxy. Cause. We head into a facility that looks like a Mayan temple. Huey's keycard is not working, and we learn it's because Strangelove is not a fan of his. Great. While trying to figure out our next steps, we have a plot twist. Cecile has never met Paz, so while the cassette tape did belong to Cecile, Paz was not her friend, so something suspicious. Cecile tells us to locate a guard in an orange jacket who took her keycard by listening to a specific bird call. Adventure time. We find him. <laughs> keycard in hand, we return to the facility and see some familiar flowers. And a familiar white horse. And another person in red. It's the doctor. She's waiting for us. Been waiting, Snake. She's not a fan. This is a strange love. She mocks Snake for killing the boss and taking the title of Big Boss. And Snake starts reciting the lies that the CIA told him. Strangelove says the boss left her behind and she was the woman that she loved. 
and she asks us if we want to meet her. This cigar shit is wild, man. And we hear the boss's voice. She is the AI in the pod, the mammal pod. We learn Strangelove received all the intel of the boss from the CIA in order to completely understand her and what choices she would make in order to make this AI possible of making a choice for the fate of the human race. But Strangelove's real goal is to clear the boss's name. She wants to know the boss's last will. Uh, same girl. Jack triggers the mammal pod and it gets angry. And Strange Love mocks us again about killing the boss again. And we are locked inside the mammal pod. While removing the boards, we hear boss lines. The pod goes haywire and Strange Love wants us out. We have flashbacks that look so amazing illustrated. We end up getting thrown in the flowers and see a hind taking the mammal pod away. And here comes Chrysalis. Time for battle. Ugh. After an intense battle, we get into this pod and destroy it, but it just takes off. She played me like a piano. Huey gives us the location of the testing base. It's under a rock quarry and cause questions if Snake will be able to destroy the AI if we can handle it because there's only one thing we haven't let go of and it's the boss and it's been 10 years. It's not gonna be easy to kill her again, but Snake doesn't even know what to believe anymore. We are on our way to the quarry riding the horse and it's an old guy. At the base, we see Peace Walker being lowered underground and a cypher spots us and snipers great battle time and when i say battle time i mean like a million guards and after those million guards and expert dodging we are met with the cocoon and i've said it before the prequel metal gears are on a whole different level than rex and ray and it's time to break the pot again and it blasts off like team rocket <laughs> we enter the facility and sneak around and can i just point out how good the music is until we reach peace walker's resting spot strange love is discussing the mammal pod with coldman and while they're not looking we somehow sneak up undetected and the boss talks to us. Have you come to destroy me? We start asking the boss questions that we know it's not gonna have the answers to, but we ask anyways. And boom, Coldman is here with his men, Lobo. And he punches us. We learn that he is the one who planned for the boss to die. We hate you officially. He wants to bring order to the entire continent and that the age of heroes is over. In order for his system to work, MSF can't exist. Strangelove interjects and says she needs to ask us more stuff for the mammal pod. Shut up! Snake has his biggest outburst to date and we fight Coldman's guards. In the commotion, we are able to grab Strangelove's card before we're taken away. And more beautiful flashbacks with our last talk with the boss until we are hit with water and welcome to another torture chamber every damn game strange love wants answers about the boss and what happened during mgs3 we claim she was just a traitor but she knows that we still carry her bandana and she questions why we have this scar on our chest she wants proof that the boss didn't betray her country but we're not giving it to her we don't want to help her finish the pod snake passes out from the torture and awakens in a cell and naturally we escape it's up to you which way you want to escape but the reason for the scar is that there's a hidden jigsaw right underneath the skin in the form of a snake after we escape we hit up cause and learn that pause has gone missing and that Paws and the professor don't exist, and Coldman has been on to us from the beginning. We get our gear and head to the hangar to destroy the AI, and they have Paws hostage. Great. Peace Walker is active. The pod is finished, and we're surprised because we stayed silent. But apparently, staying silent helped her figure out that the boss's mission was to be killed by us. I don't really understand how she got that from the silence, but okay. Strange Love claims boss is restored to life, and we're like, okay, crazy, <laughs> she did, but okay. Coldman is excited to tell us that the first target of Peace Walker is MSF and our cute little mother base. They're going to show off Peace Walker's walking capabilities by walking to the coast to nuke us. They leave with pause in an elevator, and we climb up to a giant battleground area. Peace Walker is mobile and on his way to destroy us, but if we shoot at it, it stops its main command and goes into self-defense mode, so we gotta keep it busy. We battle the pod while the boss taunts us. After downing it, it changes into a spider-like form and starts being shot by a hind piloted by Coldman and crew. Peace Walker follows the hind out of the quarry and out of nowhere, our horse jumps down to help us. Yay! Luckily, Peace Walker maxes at 25 miles per hour, but not so lucky for haters' vocal cords. Approaching the border, good old horse gets us almost there, but loses its footing and falls. We climb the rest, but are too late. It's already swimming across the Rio San Juan. God damn it, our poor horse folded it out. Hurry up. Amanda calls to lay out a plan to get us across the river by gondola, thanks to some of her connections. And Chico chimes in and confirms our horsey friend's fate. No, not at our hands again. Coldman must be aware of the launch's timing coinciding with SALT, Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, meaning the president and vice president are going to be busy during this time. More flashbacks and we hear Eva's debriefing of the boss. 
and it's all the feels. After arriving in Nicaragua, we enlist the help of a trusty old friend to sneak into the base undetected. We need to go to a communications tower, ah, communication tower, to try and mess up the control of Peace Walker. We talk to Cause about evacuating MSF just in case, but all the men believe in me. Aww. Looking back, this area is giving me like super ground zeros vibes. We avoid guards and ciphers until we arrive at the tower. Inside is a monitor room where we can see Pause and interact with her. As we talk to Pause, all the monitors turn red and we are alerted by Cause that MSF is on their way via air and sea to support us. We promise Pause we will rescue her. Snake fights his way through a war zone covered with guards, ciphers, closing gates. It's chaos. We even have another Hind D battle, and after destroying it, we get rewarded by the amazing Heavens Divide sung by the one and only Donna Burke, who follows me on Twitter, dude. We make it to the control room, and after all of that, are immediately surrounded. Coldman informs us they're uploading false data to Peace Walker, tricking it into thinking it's retaliating in order to have her launch. As he promised, MSF is the target, and as he's about to enter the code in walks the professor taking over the base took longer than expected coldman is pissed and calls him a backstabber galvez reveals he wants to take peace walker and nuke cuba since we're on an american base the world will blame the u.s for this attack galvez grabs pause and tells her to shoot coldman reminding her of the torture she faced he also gives us a real name reveal he's vladimir zadornov which means ruler of peace kojima but Paz can't do it, so Vlad forces her to shoot, but it's not a killing blow. Vladimir takes the card, kicks him, and makes him enter the code. Vlad radios to Strangelove and tells her that the target is now Cuba, and to adjust or he'll crush her beloved, and she reluctantly agrees. Vladimir reveals that he had Snake go to the Sandinistas so that we could turn them into this formidable army and have them do all the dirty work for him. The Sandinistas will be pissed and retaliate when they learn of Snake's death at the hands of the CIA. And then he says we're gonna die like the boss, as a fraud. Before he's able to kill us, suddenly the Sandinistas open fire on the guards and capture Vlad. He orders them to obey, but Amanda says they're no longer pawns for the KGB. Yes. The Sandinistas are back home in Nicaragua, and Amanda can finally feel worthy of her title. They chant, Vic Boss. We celebrate, and Amanda even gives us a hug. Strangelove pulls up and admits she wanted to know how the boss felt at the end, and knows that we want to as well. She thanks us for stopping them and dealing with her torture. We're like, eh, used to it. And we head back towards the mammal pod. Meanwhile, Kaz is talking to Paws on a chopper. While they discuss peace, Coldman enters the code in the suitcase. How did we not saw that shit off before the trip? Are you kidding me? And Peace Walker activates, targeting Cuba. With Peace Walker activated, it sent the false data to NORAD, North American Aerospace Defense Command. So no matter what, they're going to think it's a real Soviet attack. Coldman wants Langley to see how important Peace Walker is, claiming no one will retaliate because we're just human after all but peace walker will huey is busy calling norad to alert them it's not real cut the data transmission and the only person who can manually cancel the code is this dumbass cold man who has now died well <laughs> looks like our only option is to destroy the mammal pod again shooting peace walker turns it into defense mode so it can buy us some more time before she launches the nuke but ultimately, Peace Walker falls, and even though we stomped the launch, the data is still being sent. So now we need to destroy the mammal pod completely. But it's got insane armor, capable of surviving nukes. So what are we supposed to do? So Huey is now trying to contact the Pentagon to alert them that this data is fake. But it looks like Washington is actually going to launch. What? So our best bet is to sink the pod in water to get enough pressure to open the pod and short the electronics. What does that thing weigh? 500 tons. It's hopeless. We can't move that thing. But Snake says, fuck this, I'll talk to the Pentagon. So we talk to the Pentagon, we get a hold of the chairman, and they need us to prove that we're a big boss before they believe that these nukes are fake. And so we drop a little bit of MGS3 handshake knowledge on them, knowing one of them must have been present that day. And we also hint where our loyalty really lied that day, which was obviously with the boss. Rejection of the century. The chairman believes our story because he was there that day and tells them to stop the nukes. But another member pulls a gun on him and says they're not stopping the launch. They don't believe him. These people are nuts. But just then, a butterfly appears before Snake, and the boss begins calling out for Jack. The pod opens and unleashes butterflies, allowing us to jump inside and start removing boards. As we work, the boss tells us she wants the philosophers back together and to make the world whole again. Petals magically arise from the floor, and she starts going a little MGS2 Patriots crazy on us. We remove all the boards, but the data is still showing nukes. Snake begins banging on the pod, begging it to tell him why. Dude, the world is gonna end in a minute here. These idiots around the chairman still want to retaliate. 
How is the data still being transferred? Strangelove says it's like the body continuing when the brain is damaged. That reptile is taking over mammal's last wish, and we open fire on it as a last ditch effort to try to destroy it. And a countdown begins. The mammal pod suddenly turns itself on again, regaining control of Peace Walker. It starts singing a song. What's going on? And the color turns yellow. It's like a ghost in the machine. The boss lowers Peace Walker into the water to drown herself and stop the transmission. Huey claims that functional compensation must have made it happen. Instead of nukes, peace signs appear over the map. Nuclear war has been avoided. This is the fate the boss chose for herself. She chose to put down her gun and sing. And so we can only keep on hoping, hoping for the illusion we call peace. Credits roll. Of course, we have a post credit conversation where Kaz is talking to Snake, and Snake says that the boss betrayed him. That when she decided to put down her gun, it was like she rejected her entire life, including him. And he doesn't want to be like her, so now he does want the name of Big Boss, and thus, Big Boss, as we know him. After the events of Peace Walker, Strange Love joined us in MSF, and Amanda went back to her Sandinistas. Kaz is going to remain with us because she has nowhere else to go. <laughs> and the professor. We'll find him a nice, comfy cell. There are more missions available after completing the game, which include finishing the construction of Metal Gear Zeke and recapturing Vlad as he keeps escaping Mother Base. After Vlad search mission six, we are treated to a cutscene. Vlad tries to kill us and we end up shooting him dead. No more running away now, bitch. Snake and Kaz consider it must have been an inside job considering how many times he got away. And as he discuss this, suddenly Zeke begins moving and it's being piloted by Paws. In her skivvies, Kojima. <laughs> There's a reason, it's cause she's underwater, but still. Paz made some modifications to Zeke while we were out looking for that idiot constantly. And she admits that she's been working for Cypher and her name is Pacifica Ocean. What the fuck? She says Snake and Zero became enemies by misinterpreting the boss's will. MGS4 anyone? Pacifica discusses what would later become the Patriots' control over the population, and that Cypher wants MSF to be the force that protects this new order, as Cypher's deterrent. If Snake agrees, we can keep control of MSF and Zeke. Big Boss rejects her offer, and so now she's like, okay, I'll nuke the East Coast and blame it on you. And she straight up pieces us out. Now it's time to battle pause in our sweet, sweet Zeke finally finished it and it's turned against us immediately. She taunts us and eventually we do defeat her and Pacifica falls out of Zeke into the ocean. Pacifica falls into the ocean. How poetic. Well, Huey and Strangelove will get back to work repairing Zeke and they do have some interesting tension? Ableist much? What the fuck? Big Boss uses Vlad's hand to light a cigar while musing with Kaz about Cypher being a code for zero. And Kaz hits us with some major truth bombs, admitting that he knew the professor and Paz were at the beginning of all of this, and he used them for MSF's advantage. And that Paz wasn't just CIA, but she was also KGB Cypher triple agent. Snake is not thrilled, but Kaz relays it's because of them that MSF is as powerful as it is with the sweet, sweet mother base and their own revolution. We realize that now that we got involved with the KGB, we're going to be hunted and probably going to be fighting the establishment until the end of time. And we're just going to have to operate outside normal society, and that's going to be okay. The whole world's on our tail. Assemble the men. Timeline rolls. We go where we're needed, fighting not for country. Not for government, but for ourselves. This is utter heaven. And that's it. And then a couple months later, it starts uh, Metal Gear Solid Five: Ground Zeroes. I think maybe next time I'll do Metal Gear 1 and Metal Gear 2, which are pretty short, so I feel like I could just put them in one video. I don't know. Leave a comment below if you'd like to see Metal Gear 1 or Metal Gear 2 as a story of. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time.